Do you want so to live and so to believe that God would look at you and say, I am not ashamed to be your God. You want God to say that over you? I am not ashamed to be your God. Is it possible for God to be proud to be our God? In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper opens Hebrews 11, 13 to 22 for the surprising news of why God is not ashamed of a particular group of sinners. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on June 29th, 1997. Right here in the middle of verse 16, I want you to see the word therefore. There's a glorious therefore here. It says in the middle of verse 16, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Now, when I read that, I was stunned. I've always looked at that and thought, that's awesome. I mean, I try to think, is there any place else in the Bible where God talks about being unashamed? And I did some word searches and I find all kinds of verses about my being unashamed of God. I don't know another place in the Bible where the shame of God is at issue. God's shame. Where God looks shame in the face and says, I will not have it. I will not be ashamed. God does not do shameful things. Therefore, he never feels shame. Now, do you, I ask you this. This is what I want. I assume the answer to this question is going to be, answer to this question is going to be yes. Do you want so to live and so to believe that God would look at you and say, I am not ashamed to be your God? You want God to say that over you? I am not ashamed. To be your God. Well, I do. Because you know what the alternative is? I'm ashamed of you. And God never feels shame. God does nothing shameful. Which means the alternative of God's not being ashamed of us is that he's not our God. Those are the two possibilities. A lot is at stake here. In Exodus 3, 6, God said, I am the God of your father, Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now why is he not ashamed of them? They're sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. But over some people, among sinners, God says, I'm not ashamed to be your God. What do you, what do you have to do to get that? Some big performance that God can say, I'm proud of that. That's good. You, you really performed well. All right, Piper. Come on in, I'm not ashamed of that. Where's somebody else performing well? Is that our God? Look, words are in the Bible for reasons. Did you know that? Words are in the Bible for reasons. And two of my favorite words are therefore and because. Because in this text, the word therefore And the word because, give me the two reasons why God is not ashamed of me. It's real important that we see this. There's a reason before and there's a reason at the end. He says there in verse 16, God is not ashamed. We can all see that phrase, right? We got our eyes on that phrase. God is not ashamed. Now, just before it is the word therefore. And just after it, God is not ashamed to be called their God, comes for he has prepared a city for them. So you got a therefore in the front of it and a for in the back of it. You know what that means? That means 
that coming after it is a reason for why he isn't ashamed, and coming before it is a reason why he isn't ashamed. And if you want to know how not to let God be ashamed of you, you got to pick up on both of those. That's how you got to read the Bible. You got to see things like this. You got to read, he's not ashamed of a certain person. Now, why is he not ashamed? Let's take the second one and then the first one and put them together. The second one is because he has prepared a city for you. God's been at work, according to John 14 and Matthew 25, he's been at work before the worlds were preparing a place for his people. He is building a city, a beautiful, glorious place of infinite satisfaction. He's been doing that. He's been energized to do that. That's what grace does in its spare time. That's reason number one. Now, reason number two comes at the front of he is not ashamed, introduced by therefore. So we got to back up and get it. They desire a better country, that is a heavenly one, therefore God is not ashamed. When God sees hearts that imperfect as we are, want Him, desire Him, He says, I'm not ashamed to be that God's person, that person's God. I'm not ashamed. Why? Now, here's the question. Why? He made a city of fulfillment and joy and infinite satisfaction. And if we will have it, if we greet it from afar and say, that's what I want. I want you, God. I want your city. I want everything that you have to offer over what the world has to offer. Why does God look upon a heart like that, even with all of its sin, and say, I'm not ashamed to be that person's God? Is it because desire is an achievement? You all know desire is not an achievement. It's not a performance. It's real or it's not, period. If it's there, it's real. If it's not real, it's not there. Desire is desire. And not only that, nobody boasts in desiring. Nobody boasts for getting hungry. Ah, oh, if you're really hungry, good night, John. Would you stop preaching? i got to go home. I'm hungry. Nobody says, and you see how cool I am? How good I am? I'm hungry. Are you hungry? I'm hungry. So I'm better than you are. Nobody talks like that. We know nobody talks like that. There's nothing to boast in about hunger. Especially if you've been without food a long time and somebody puts in front of you the most glorious feast imaginable, namely God. And you suddenly feel hunger by grace for this God. You don't say, oh, cool, I must be somebody, I feel hungry. Nobody talks like this is not a performance. This is not an achievement. This is not a moral victory over some great uh, thing you were doing, doing wrong. This is before any doing comes on the scene. This is a heart leaning, a heart inclination towards God. Now, why does he say, I'm not ashamed? Well, ask this question. What would be the opposite? If he put it positively instead of negatively. If he said, um, not only am I not ashamed to be called your God, I am blank to be called your God. Stick a word in. Proud. Well, that's scary. What do you mean? You proud of me? That's not what I said. I said, I'm proud to be called your God. I'm proud to be called your God. Why? Why would he be proud to be called your God? Because when you desire God more than you desire anything, you call attention to God's greatness. When you desire something, you're not showing how great you are, you're showing how great that something is, right? That's why God is impressed. He's not impressed with you. You have absolutely nothing to impress God with, nor do I. 
And the good news is you don't have to. And I'm so glad I do not have to impress God with anything. What I have to do is start feeling desire for what is impressive in the universe. Namely, God. And start falling out of love with all the stuff that I think is so impressive on the earth. Money and TV and sports and clothing and cars and computers and certain kinds of vacations. i got to fall out of love with that so that my heart is caught up and I can say my treasure is now in heaven and then I'm calling all attention to where the value is and God is very impressed with God because He's a righteous God. He has to be impressed with what's great. And when we call attention to the greatness of God, God is not ashamed to be our God. Well, let me draw this to a close by simply applying Abraham to you in verses 17 to 19. Just one point for you to leave with that will be, I think, very pointed for us all. In verses 17 to 19, we have the picture of Abraham offering up Isaac. It says in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Now the reason this is so amazing is not only because it's his only son, not only because the Ten Commandments are going to say don't kill, but mainly in this text, because God has promised to Abraham, Abraham, someday you're going to have more descendants than the sands on the seashore. And they're going to come through Isaac. I promise you. I promise you. I'm God. I promise you. They're coming through Isaac. Now kill him. Now here's the application to your life. I've been carrying on an email with a couple that's breaking up. And aching inside and trying my best to keep them from breaking up. And I emailed them about this yesterday. Right, stopped right in the middle of my sermon. I said, this is for them. So I sent separate emails to them. I said, I said you know, what you're facing right now in the choice of whether to stay married or not is whether to kill Isaac or not. Feels that impossible. I mean, I've dealt with dozens of divorcing couples over the years. And I, I know that some, some marriages become impossible to work out together at home. I know that, especially in cases of horrendous violence and abuse. But 90% of the time, it's because one will not trust God. Or both. They won't believe Him. They say, if I stay, I will be miserable. And God doesn't want me to be miserable for the rest of my life. Therefore, I don't think He wants me to stay. That's, that's the scenario over and over and over Again. And I picture Abraham saying, God, now look, I want seed. I want heirs. You told me, you told me that they're all going to come through Isaac. And now you ask me to give up that dream of a happy life. Give it up. I don't believe you. I don't trust you. Now, Abraham did not say that. That's why he's in the book. He took him on the mountain. He lifted the knife. And God, to keep his own law and to bless this obedience, provided a substitute. And the lesson is... You can trust him. 
The issue for some of you this morning is, will you stay married? The issue for others is, will you stay single? The issue for others is, will you leave the job you're in? The issue for others, will you stay in your job for me? The issue for others is, will you get baptized this summer? For others, it's, will you speak up at work? Finally, speak up, speak up about me, will you? Lift the knife up over the reputation. For others, it's, will you confront that person that you know is living in sin and risk your friendship? For another, will you be a missionary? Will you yield to that call? And in every case, more or less, we feel like the step of obedience or the step of yielding to the call of God is going to make us miserable. It's just, it just not going to work. I don't care what you say, Pastor. It isn't going to work. I mean, what else could Abraham say? The promise will not be fulfilled if I kill my son. Everything human says so. And that's the life of faith, folks. Those are the kinds of things we got to do. Will we not only desire God more, but now will we trust a God who, as it were, can raise the dead? Marriage. So let me close like this. I want in a minute for some of you to stand for prayer and to declare with your body a hunger. And here's, I don't want everybody to stand. Here's the kind of people I I would like to invite to stand to pray for. And then we'll sing and we'll be done. If there's something in your life, maybe a moral crisis, you've got a big choice in, a vocational crisis, a relational crisis, something pretty big. That's why I don't want everybody to stand. Everybody's got something. But something that's been eaten at you, something you really need help with, and you want to say by standing these two things, then I invite you to stand. Number one, God, I really want to desire you more than anything in this issue. I want to desire you. More than anything. Number two, I want to trust you for obedience. I can't see how obedience is going to make my life anything other than difficult and maybe long term miserable. But I want to trust you that you're good and you do fulfill your promises, some now in this life and wonderfully later on. If you are Willing to say those two things. I want to desire you. I want to trust you for this thing that I'm facing. Why don't you stand right now so I can pray for you. Let's just stand. Okay. I'm going to pray for these standing and all of the rest of us will too. And then we're going to sing this great song, He is able. He's able to raise Isaac from the dead. He's able to do what you what you got to trust Him for. So let me pray. Lord, only You know right now what these issues are. That's good. That's good. You know. And I want to ask God that, first of all, a gift of desire would be given. So that the desire that enabled these to stand would just explode with a desire for You And for the city that is to come will be bigger than their desire for anything else. And then secondly, Father, I pray for trust. Confidence that you can turn the path of obedience into the path of joy. That's what's so hard to believe right now for so many, Lord. That the path of obedience would be a path of joy. Lord, grant that kind of Abraham-like confidence, I pray. 
This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 12-part series, Risk Taking Faith, with a sermon titled, Faith Trusts the God Who Rewards. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.